Amen. Amen. Good morning and welcome to First Methodist Church as we gather for worship uh, on campus, online, on radio, on TV. Uh, we gather as God's people together uh, uh, in these strange days. Uh, it is good to see uh, those of you who are here, uh, and, and I'm, I'm praying for those of you uh, who are not able to be here for whatever reason. Uh, and we just uh, continue to worship God in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, we continue to worship God as we continue to love one another uh, throughout all this. Uh, I do want to remind you that we are collecting donations for the Back to School Bash uh, that's sponsored by Mission Carthage. Uh, that'll be coming up uh, next weekend. Uh, next Saturday is going to be special uh, because we're doing it at the high school. It's going to be a drive-through. Uh, it's not going to be the big convention center style that we normally like uh, and love. But uh, please write a, a check or give a, an amount either to Mission Carthage or here to uh, First Methodist by writing in the note line uh, back to school bash. Also today uh, for our communion offering, uh, we are going to be giving uh, we have an opportunity to give to UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief. Uh, you might have noticed there's been a few hurricanes, uh, both in the Atlantic. Uh, we even heard about one, uh, a rare one, uh, heading for Hawaii. Uh, and then we've heard about a, a fire now in California. Uh, this is the season when a lot of disasters uh, tend to occur. Uh, and so this is our opportunity as United Methodists, as, as Christians worldwide, uh, to give to a agency uh, that puts boots on the ground, not boots, I guess they put hearts uh, on the ground, and, uh, uh, but, but otherwise uh, uh, meets these needs uh, and then helps to mobilize us for those things that are more local. Uh, and then finally, uh, today is Communion Sunday. Uh, it's open to all, whether you're a Methodist, whether you're uh, a member here or not, uh, we'll be uh, having and celebrating uh, this uh, Holy Supper of the Lord. Let us worship. We praise the Lord in song today. Hey. 
To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Let none that wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are called to treachery. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Amen. And I want, I want to add these that have come up over this past week. Uh, pray for uh, Martha Arnold, for Michelle Chapel, for Bay Wayne Thompson, for Ricky Pride, for baby Allie Thompson, uh, who had heart surgery this past week, for Suzanne Payne. And we ask uh, condolences and prayers for the following families, for the families of J.D. Weeks, uh, a friend of the Pitchfords, uh, for the family of Pat Smith here in town, 
and for the family of Linda Anderson, and for the family of Alan Rogers. For each of these, we ask God's uh, blessings uh, and mercy for. Let us now go to the Lord in prayer for silently, privately, and I'll lead us together. O Savior, gentle Savior, please don't pass us by. Please come and take your place in the hearts of each of us. We open our hearts to you now, Lord. Remind us of your presence. Give us that assurance that can come only from your presence within our hearts. Reminding us that you have loved us and loved us enough to give us new life. Lord, help us in our time of need. Whatever might be perplexing us right now, whatever might be tempting us right now, whatever might be keeping us from a abundant life in you. Lord, we ask that you would minister to it. Give us the strength by your Holy Spirit to resist temptations that come in front of us, however they present themselves. And Lord, help us not to be those who are treacherous to others, but those who out of your compassion are compassionate for others. Help us, Lord, to live as your people in the world, lights in the midst of a world that darkens ever so much. Salt that continues to provide uh, its purpose in the midst of a world that has become so bland, so sour, so selfish. Help us to be your salt of the earth, your light upon the hill, your children in the world, that others might come to know you and put their faith in you as well. For Lord, we don't serve a God of death, but a God of life. A God who was able to overcome death and sin itself that his son could totally vanquish and then provide that life for us and that hope for us and that promise for us. Help us today, Lord, even as we ask these concerns of others upon our hearts. We pray for the continued blessings for Catherine Rhodes and Spencer Bates, for Sharon Ivey and Colin Hanks. We ask your continued blessings for Seth Smith and Gary Fitzgerald, for Joe Roy McMillan and family, for Tina Hooper and Martha Harness. Lord, we ask your continued healing and recovery for Amanda Grappe, for Sandy Griffin, for Patricia Vasquez, and for all these that we have mentioned. Lord, receive them, hear them, and Lord, we know and take it as a matter of faith that you are already working on each of them now. For we ask all this in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. so much for, for the blessings of this day, the blessings of 
um, the beautiful nature you have put around us, the blessings of this place where we can come and worship. Lord, we, we thank you for the blessings of this new technology that we don't, if we can't come to church, church can come to us. That is new and amazing. Lord, we thank you again for all of the things that, that this congregation means to this community. All of the things that your church means to the world. That it is light and soul. And that is what it's meant to be. Lord, we just ask that you will accept our gifts and offerings. That they are given freely. They are given with joy. And that they'll be used freely and used with joy to promote your kingdom in this world that needs it so desperately. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> to 
That is love. We're also going to hear about Paul's love here in a scripture that's a little challenging to hear, but nonetheless needful for us. Would you please stand as you are able for the reading of God's word? It's chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. It comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul writes, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying my conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites and to them belong the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belongs the patriarchs. And from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is overall God blessed forever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. A classic book that came out, I think about 40 years ago, which my kids have come to enjoy, uh, just came to mind as I was reading this particular pericope in uh, Romans, this beginning of chapter 9 that will continue all the way through 12. Uh, it's the Berenstain Bears and the spooky old tree. And, and I think about that because it is a, uh, a sequence of events and a litany that goes on again and again and again, which helps kids to read, it helps kids to, to learn sounds, but also helps us to understand a little bit more about what Paul is talking about with Israel. It begins three little bears, one with a light, one with a stick, one with a rope, a spooky old tree. Do they dare go into that spooky old tree? Later on, do they dare go up to that twisty old stair? Later on, will, do they dare go into that spooky old hall? And then they reverse the litany and they say, well, they went into the spooky old tree. They went up the twisty old stair. They went down the slide. They dared to go into the spooky old hall. Do they dare cross over the great sleeping bear? Well, yes, they dare because they've done all these other things. And, of course, the, the story ends up with the three little bears uh, safely at home. But the Apostle Paul shares with us today a litany of events that took place amongst his ancestors, which are our spiritual ancestors. And he does that by, by listing out eight things, eight privileges that, that helped his people, 
the Israelites, the Hebrews, or the Jews as they were known during his time. He says they are Israelites, first of all. They are ones who are named after Jacob, who, who got changed, his name got changed to Israel because he was one that wrestled with God. Israel, which literally means wrestles with God. Coming from Genesis. Yisrael wrestles with El, wrestles with God. He says they are Israelites. First of all, and so they have this history and this, this lineage of wrestling with God. And he says this, he says, and to them belong the adoption. Because Paul remembers how they were adopted by God. You are the children of the Lord your God. Do not cut yourselves or shave the front of your heads for the dead. He uh, is written in Deuteronomy, that is, that they were supposed to keep themselves as a separate and holy people by laws that would help to identify them over and against all others who did not fear God or follow after him. And what they find uh, later in Hosea chapter 11, uh, the prophet writes, when Israel was a child, I loved him and out of Egypt, I called my son. They are the original children of God, Paul writes. And as we are reminded from Deuteronomy and Hosea, Paul says that theirs is also the glory, the glory. They basked in the presence of God. When Moses went up to the mountain to receive the law. While Aaron was speaking, the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. It says in Exodus 16, chapter, uh, uh, verse 10. And then later on in Exodus 34, the, the radiant face of Moses was seen with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands. He was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him because he had been so close to God himself. He was a changed person. Moses only knew perhaps more of who he really was because he had entered into this relationship with God, but the people were afraid of him because he looked different. He was radiant. He had the God love. On him and awesomeness but more so the Apostle Paul writes uh, not only did they have the covenants but they had the giving of the law they were partners partners with God in covenants and it began with Abraham in Genesis chapter 7 verse 3 Abraham fell face down and God said to him as for me this is my covenant with you you will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. And I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you. And kings will come from you. I will give as an everlasting possession to you. The whole land of Canaan. To you and your descendants after you. And I will be their God. Jeremiah the prophet wrote, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Paul remembers that they are, they, are, uh, they are the Israelites named after Israel himself, those who wrestle with God. They are the children of God who've been adopted by him. They basked in the presence of God. They've become partners with God in covenant. Paul says, they also uh, uh, received this law specifically. He says, 
On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, this is in Exodus chapter 19, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai and they set out from Rephidim. And they entered the desert of Sinai and Israel camped down in the desert in front of the mountain. And then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the citizens of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. And on the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast and everyone in the camp trembled. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us. You put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. Moses realized the people didn't act very holy. He says, they can't go up there. They're not holy. The Lord replied, you go down and bring Aaron up with you. So Moses went down to the people and told them. And, and then... He went back up to receive the law. And he brought that law, the Ten Commandments, and all those that we know thereafter that helped to define them as a separate people. Not only had they received the covenants and the law, but they also had this distinct worship. Paul reminded them first through Solomon, then later on into the second temple period of which Paul himself was in. This this divine and special worship. Having the priest who would go into the Holy of Holies uh, in order to provide the sacrifice to God in a beautiful temple dedicated only to God. In 1 Kings 6, in the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. The temple that, that King Solomon built for the Lord was 60 cubits long, 20 wide, and 30 high. The portico at the front of the main hall of the temple extended the width of the temple, that is 20 cubits, and projected 10 cubits from the front of the temple. The lowest floor was 5 cubits wide, the middle floor 6 cubits, and the third floor 7 he prepared the inner sanctuary with the temple to set the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 wide, and 20 high, and he overlaid the inside with pure gold, and he also overlaid the altar of cedar. Now, this second temple of which Paul knew wasn't quite as stunning as this first temple, but nonetheless, it was stunning, it was magnificent, it was set apart, it was consecrated, it was holy. It was a way for the people to go and to atone for their sins once a year by bringing their sacrifices or to give thanks regularly at different festivals by bringing their sacrifices. Paul says this was part of the heritage of, of Israel. But not only did they have the, the covenant and the law and the worship, but they also had the promises. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 5, when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in the month. And then they began to share in the promises that God had given them. They entered into this land and they entered into a life with God, a specialized people set apart to be a blessing to others. They had received these promises of God, these people of Israel. And they had the patriarchs. They had the patriarchs. Abraham. And Jacob all the way through Moses. And King David. Who they could point to and say, yes, these were men after God's own heart.
Paul recounts a list of eight privileges, eight divine privileges that were given to his people. It's no wonder Paul's heart was struggling. Paul himself had been a Pharisee's Pharisee. He had been the one who knew the law, and he had been there even as he watched the bloody stoning of Stephen, the first martyr of the church. When the church was so nascent, when Christians were so few, they had been kicked out of the synagogues. And, and then now Paul, armed with letters from the Sanhedrin, was going around to different places trying to root out these Christians. And he watched as Stephen was stoned to death. Paul, who later would find himself in a very strange circumstance. On his way to Damascus, a bright light suddenly shines down and blinds him and he hears a voice, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And, and he becomes blinded and only afterwards later on when he goes to see Ananias does he find himself healed and he finds himself with a new mission, not to persecute the church, but to share the gospel to share the good news with people. This Paul who had this burden both lifted off of him, a, a burden of judgment and of condemnation of going around, the, the burden of the law as he talked about. The law was good as a good gift from God, but this, this law which could become a burden because our humanness, our sinfulness could cause us to start putting our faith in the law rather into God. This Paul who had had this burden lifted from him now has a new burden but it's a new burden that is added to by the Holy Spirit and it is moved and it's a burden to help save the lost to help save those who don't know the good news of Jesus Christ and so Paul writes in chapter 9, right after he's talked about all the, the wonderfulness of being in God, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. He has just written at the very end of chapter 8, and then he begins, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I mean, he is just reiterating and, and trying to underline and, and trying to show and implore how deeply this is affecting him. He doesn't tell us exactly what it is at first that's affecting him. He just begins. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing, unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ. Only then does he tell us what this great burden is he has now. And this burden is for his own people. He says, for the sake of my own people, my kindred, according to the flesh. He says, I myself was accursed and cut off and this, this word uh, anathema that we have, I am anathema, that is I'm cut off and from others, is used right here. It comes from the Greek word. And he says they are Israelites. They have all these privileges, all these gifts from God. And yet they don't know the wonderful truth of Jesus Christ. Later on, Paul will count more upon this. And what we know is that what God begins, God is faithful to finish. We find that that remnant of, of the Jews continues on. And those who continue to follow in the promises and, and in the, the worship and in the law of God, the covenants that God has provided for them, God does have a place for them. We know that. Sometimes this scripture and others have been used as a way to, to, uh, 
to persecute Jews themselves. And I don't think that's what Paul's saying. In fact, I think it's the exact opposite of what Paul is saying. Paul has such a deep burden. He says, I am willing to give myself up. Now he says, he says, I must, for I, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people. Not that he does wish, because he knows the awesome love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He knows the power. He says, but I could wish according to the flesh. And so the original Paul, who was known as Saul, uh, who was a Pharisee's Pharisee and, and would go around and root him out, he says, the original Paul would have just given himself up. But for the Jews of that time, particularly uh, other than the Pharisees, uh, salvation was not that big of an issue. Afterlife was not that big of an issue. And so, so he's thinking, if, if I needed to be a martyr, the fleshly Paul, the, the before Christ Paul, would say, I would give myself up for my people. But the new Paul, who's in Christ, still has the burden for his people. But now... He also knows the incomparable grace of Jesus Christ. He knows the possibility that where we can't see, God can provide a way. And so he says, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off. That's how strongly I feel about it. If it was only according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. I don't want to cut myself off from God because the riches of that joy, of that grace of that relationship is too powerful to give up. Nonetheless, because I have received it and, and have it, I want to share it. And if after all this other sequence of events, uh, if they dared to be called Israelites, if, if they dared uh, to belong to the adoption and, and to, to have the glory and the covenant, if, if, if they dared to, to follow the patriarchs, then if we think about that spooky old tree, won't they dare to follow Jesus Christ? Paul says to the church at Rome, which is made up largely of Gentile Christians, says we still have a purpose. is to go out and to share the good news with all people out there. But knowing God's promises will work themselves out for God's people along the way. For if the Jews can't be faithful or expect God to be faithful in the promises that God provided for them, then what can we hope to have in promises for us? But if God is still faithful to them, and now we believe God will be faithful to us, amen? Then if God is faithful to us, then we're called to go out and to share the good news out to the ends of the earth. Baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we did this past Sunday, as we continue to do, remembering that God is at work in us. The question for us today is, who is this big burden upon your heart? Maybe it's a friend a family member, a neighbor. Maybe it's this community. Maybe it's a certain people around the world like missionaries who've been called to go to Africa or to China or to South Texas or right down the road. Who has God placed such a burden upon your heart today? That you'd be almost willing to give yourself a uh, to break your relationship with Christ that they might have it. Almost willing. Sometimes we forget our individual and corporate responsibility to share the good news one-on-one, -on -one, to be ready to be a light in the world, to be ready to account for the faith, the hope, and the joy that's within us through Jesus Christ. I encourage you, therefore, to do these things. One, think about your own relationship with Christ. How is it that you came to the saving knowledge of Jesus? 
Who was it that maybe first shared with you? Who was it who perhaps first gave you the understanding and introduced you to Jesus? Think about that and think about how you might reciprocate and share what you know about Jesus and your relationship with him with others. Two, I encourage you to pray for those who are a burden upon your hearts. It may be someone in your family. It may be someone next door. It may be someone half a world away. But remember them in your prayers. Ask God's Holy Spirit to work upon their hearts. Maybe even to provide you with an opportunity to share your faith testimony. Three, and finally, I'll offer this to you. Last month when we... Uh, first did our, I guess maybe it was two months ago, we did our first communion with these cups, and we're doing that because of the COVID-19, trying to keep everybody safe and sanitary. Somebody says, you know, maybe people could take a few of these home and give it to somebody. And so that's the third thing I want to say is I have put extra ones up here with sanitized hands uh, up on the communion rail. And so after church, if there's somebody in your family, maybe who couldn't be here, uh, maybe a, a friend who couldn't be here that you like to go and share Holy Communion with, uh, come and take uh, as many of these as you need and go and share. It might be one of our, uh, a, a, a church member who sits in the pew next to you or in front of you, but take these and go and share uh, this grace of Jesus Christ. Even as we now share together this grace of Jesus Christ in Holy Communion. I invite you to turn to page 12 uh, on your, uh, in your hymnal or to watch on the screen as we share in this holy covenant together. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. And we have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people here on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you've given birth to your church. And you've delivered us from a slavery to sin and death. And you've made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to you, Father, and then he offered it to all of them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, Father, and then he offered it to all of them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, this is the blood of the new covenant 
poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you do it. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim together the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly table. For all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forevermore. Amen. And now as the children of God, let us join together uh, in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of our Lord shed for you. O Lord, place upon each of our hearts a burden, a burden to serve you and to share your good news in all the ways that we can. Help us to live our lives in such a way that we are a light that glorifies you. And Lord, when available, when you deem necessary, give us the words to share that others might know your good news. We give you thanks for this sacrament that has given us life and continues to give us life even as we walk in your way. For we ask it all in the saving name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing hymn. Yeah. 
bursting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. So my neighbor, if the things this world gave you, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon each and every one of you and give you peace. Amen and amen. amen.